beneath the depths of Lake Powell lies history of the past. A past full of clues and mysteries that tell us of a time that has been forgotten, buried, and submerged. The Colorado River Corridor, known as Glen Canyon, has hosted many mysteries. From the ancients of the cliffs who vanished from this land in the early 1300s, whom they left in such a hurry, pots full of food still in them. Glen Canyon, abandoned, 1,000 years ago. Why? Spanish coins discovered near modern-day Hall's Crossing leave mysteries of whom the coins belong to. The youngest of these tokens of the past date as far back as 1284, 208 years before Christopher Columbus's discovery of the New World. Priests of the Catholic Church who roamed the steep cliffs of Glen Canyon looking for a way out of their prison in the year of our Lord, 1776. A prison they wandered into, seeing the Colorado River from the cliffs, these Spaniards, desperate to find a crossing, could only pray to their God. With winter approaching, these priests know what their fate may be in the canyon of the great unknown. Lake Powell, the gatekeeper, hides the past of Glen Canyon yet to be rediscovered again. Today, we will discover whom passed by here in 1776, whom we know as Dominguez and Escalante, the first European discovery of the modern southwestern United States and its lost treasure known as the Crossing of the Fathers. Franciscans, a group of religious monks in the order of the Catholic Church, highly dedicated, detached from material possessions and living in simplicity. Ignacio Dominguez, born in Mexico City in 1740, Mexico City, being the former Aztec Empire, was transformed into the capital of New Spain, the Spanish Empire. At 17 years old, Dominguez joined the order of the Franciscans and became a friar in 1757. In 1776, Dominguez arrived in what was then the Spanish frontier of Nuevo Mexico, New Mexico. He was tasked with revitalizing the frontier's missions, also with the possibility of finding an overland route to the mission of Monterey in today's central California. Another dedicated Franciscan that found himself in the Spanish frontier of New Spain was Silvestre Escalante. Born in the hills of Spain in 1749, in the late 1760s, he arrived in Mexico City. At 18 years old, he joined the Franciscan Brotherhood. In 1774, he was assigned to the Zuni Pueblo. Escalane was a dedicated friar whose life was based around his faith. In June 1776, Escalane was summoned by Dominguez to join him on a mission to establish a trade route from Santa Fe to Monterey on the Pacific coast. Escalane wrote the journal we read today, but Dominguez was in charge of the expedition. To understand Spain's role in the American Southwest, we must discuss a man whose goal was simple, God, glory, and gold.
Francisco Coronado, a conquistador, who led a huge Entrada expedition into what would be future Kansas. 400 men and 1,300 Indian allies marched north to find the seven cities of Cibola. Gold, the motivator, led thousands of natives to their deaths. For two years, he searched with frustration, while only finding dust and sandstone. Lured further north by tales of gold by a man named the Turk, the Turk leading him to the Great Plains, Coronado, unamused, ordered the Turk strangled to death. Destruction, chaos was all around. Coronado's quest for riches opened the door for Spain's influence to the native cultures of the modern American Southwest. Dominguez and Escalante had the foundation to make their mark, to carve their path in the rocks, to them provide God's will. While in the desert serving their crown, another group of men, 1,700 miles away, were rejecting a crown of their own. These men were on a mission of discovery. Unknown lands, animals, and mountains in Colorado. Indians with full beards living on Utah Lake. The corridor of the Colorado River near modern-day Lee's Ferry. Let's put things into context. These expeditions were important. They opened trade routes and resupply areas for Spain to further establish their presence in the New World. From Mexico City to Santa Fe was 1,200 miles. This distance took about six months these men had no idea how far their destination to Monterey would be. On July 29, 1776, with 10 men, Dominguez and Escalante take their first steps north. A week of walking up hills and canyons of the Mesa Verde region they tread on. By September 5th, 39 days and 575 miles, they stumble upon the Rio Tucson. They name this river, unknowing it was indeed the Colorado River. September the 13th, they arrived to the Green River near Vernal, Utah. Continuing northwest, they discovered to their surprise inland lakes as big as a small sea. These lakes will be utilized by the Mormon pioneers and will establish Salt Lake City. On the 25th of September, the Spaniards befriended Indians with beards, so much so that they thought these men may be descendants of the lost Spaniards during the Coronado's days in 1542. 240 years prior to the 1776 expedition. They head south of modern-day Utah Lake with their Laguna guides who joined them. They arrived to the Severe River, confusing it for the Green River they had previously crossed. Continuing to the south, the temperature had noticeably been dropping every night. On October the 8th, 72 days and 355 miles of westward progress, snow began to fall. The Spaniards waited out the storm as it continued to snow. The Spaniards had no idea how far Monterey was from their current position. As the crow flew, they still had 550 miles left. Dominguez and Escalante decided at this camp near modern-day Milford, Utah, it would be best to abandon the Monterey mission and return southeast towards the known Hopi and Zuni Pueblos. Continuing south on October 11th, Escalante is starting to complain about other members of the party, that they are not putting the business of heaven before their worldly desires. The Padres continuing south past modern-day Cedar City and continue along the Hurricane Cliffs. On this route, they travel through the modern-day Sand Hollow Reservoir. By October 19th, Dominguez and Escalante were well on their way through the Arizona Strip, heading towards the Kaibab Plateau. By October 22nd, they follow the Kaibab Lowlands and arrive in what is today House Rock Valley Road. Earlier that day on the 22nd, Dominguez had sent out scouts ahead to search for food and water. Later that evening, in the distance, they noticed a campfire. Upon approaching the campfire, they noticed the scouts sitting with a group of Indians. When the Padres arrived to the campfire, the Indians scattered. 
Afraid of these strange white men, they fed them and led them to a watering hole so the horses can drink. This watering hole we can observe today. At the camp near Coyote Springs on October 23rd, a group member was sick. While the other priests slept, the natives they had discovered at the campfire had noticed the man's illness and tried to cure him with chants and drum. Escalani had awoke from the chants and had seen and learned that the crew member had agreed for a cure. Escalani and Dominguez were horrified due to their strong Catholic belief. That morning, they slaughtered a horse to eat but never left the camp due to now Escalani feeling ill. He had a severe anal pain which he couldn't even move. On October the 24th, they travel along the Vermilion Cliffs and reach their next camp. The historic marker is located near today's Highway 89. With no guides, the Padres can only hope to find a crossing on the river. October the 26th. The Padres reached the Colorado River after walking the desert of the Arizona Strip. They camp near the confluence of the Perea and Colorado Rivers. This place is what we know today as Lee's Ferry. With no direct way out of the river, they search for a way to escape the Echo Cliffs and the Gorge of Glen Canyon. Two of the best swimmers of the party, clothes on head, naked, swam across the Colorado River. Midway, the men struggle and lose their clothing. Naked and shoeless, the men have no way to explore and find a way out. A few days pass, and Escalane builds a makeshift raft out of driftwood and local shrubs. The raft contained a long tree branch that was used as a pole to push the river's bottom. But the river is deep, and the winds kept pushing the men back to the river's banks. Three days pass, the Padres order a horse to be eaten. Trapped, they name this place... San Benito de Sosopuedes. In English, that is, get out if you can. Three days had passed before they decided to kill and eat another horse. The Padres sent two men upstream of the Perea River to look for a better ford. This wasn't a simple task. They summoned the Mesa and looked for a route which took three days before they returned. On November the 2nd, upon the scouts' return, Dominguez and Escalani observed the findings made and were hesitant but realized the climb up to the cliffs was their only choice. Steep, sandy, rocky, and 2,000 feet high, they push forward. Escalante describes the climb in his journal. We spent more than three hours climbing it. At the beginning, it was very rugged and sandy, and afterwards has a very difficult stretches. After climbing the cliffs, they head downhill over long slopes, which guided them, turned northeast through the thick sand dunes near today's Thousand Pocket area. The Padres built camp on November 3rd near a small stream that was saline, but fit to drink. The stream is today's Walweep Creek. That camp, Escalante noted in his journal, little mesas and peaks of red earth which at first sight looked like the ruins of a fortress. Escalante is in fact describing Castle Rock, located in today's Wawi Bay. On November the 4th, the Spaniards find themselves on the cliff's edge looking for a route down the canyon. They set camp looking towards Navajo Creek or today's Navajo Canyon. Escalani in his journal complains about the cliffs, the rough rocks, and the overall route. The expedition thus far has found themselves landlocked on one side of a canyon. Each step forward, they have no clue whether or not they are going to find a route to exit. Each side canyon, nook, and cranny, they look and pray for a spot to escape. On November the 6th, a scout was sent to find a ford in the river. They found a difficult path, but returned to inform the Padres. On November the 7th, the Padres investigate the route. They observed the horse's difficulty proceeding forward on the slick rock. They chiseled out steps with axes so the horses could continue. The Padres reached the river's banks, where it could be crossed without swimming. They rode their horses across the river. Dominguez and Escalane discovered what would be known as the Crossing of the Fathers. The Padres had overcoming joy and fired off muskets and praised God. Escaped from their canyon hell, the Padres continue onward towards the Hopi Mesas. It took nine days for the Spaniards to finally reach the Hopi Mesas on November the 16th. 
The Hopi sheltered the Franciscans and also provided them food. The Spaniards spent majority of December at the Pueblos. Finally, on January 2nd, 1777, they arrived back to Santa Fe. Antonio Armijo, a Mexican trader 54 years after Dominguez and Escalante, wanted to capitalize on trade, establish a southern route between Santa Fe and Los Angeles. He used the Dominguez and Escalante route on many sections of his trail. His trail, being south, would utilize the winter months due to the northern section of the old Spanish trail being impassable in the snow months. Jebediah Smith, John C. Fremont, and many men of American myth have used the foundation of Dominguez and Escalante's expeditional trail. Returning from the Monterey expedition, Dominguez submitted a critical report to his Franciscan superiors about the mismanagement of the administration of New Mexico. This report caused retaliation from the higher-ups, which caused him to fall out of favor with his Franciscan leadership. Thus, they assigned him to the frontier of the Sonoran Desert missions, near today's northern Mexico and southern Arizona. Dominguez died between 1803 and 1805. He was 65 years old. After the expedition, Escalante remained in New Mexico for three years, poking around the Pueblos as a missionary friar. A kidney ailment plagued him continuously until he requested permission to return to Mexico City for treatment he died on his travel to Mexico City in Parral, Mexico in April of 1780 at only 30 years old. The crossing of the Fathers in Glen Canyon had been a very important crossing for natives long before its discovery by Dominguez and Escalante in November of 1776. The crossing was used as a template for Antonio Armijo's route in the future Spanish Trail also used by Mormons and Navajo raiding parties. Early maps bore the Spanish name Elvado de los Padres, Ford of Our Fathers, but has given away to the Crossing of the Fathers. After Lee's Ferry was built in 1872, the crossing was lost but rediscovered yet again in 1938. A plaque was placed in Padre Creek but removed when Lake Powell began to fill. In the 1950s and 60s, the river crossing was a popular spot for river rats of the era such as Tad Nichols and Art Green, to name a few. As for today, the crossing is now a part of Lake Powell's largest bay, Padre Bay.